are a parent here this morning, I'm thinking that you might agree with me that there is not one thing more discouraging or disorientating than for a parent to experience the pain of having a prodigal child. As parents, you know, we feel defeated. You know, we feel devastated. I mean, do you do when, what do you do when a child is like too stubborn to listen to you any longer? You know, when he's too angry to, to reason with, you know, and he's too old to spank. <laughs> now, maybe you have an adult child who could even be like married and have children, you know, and, uh, you know, and they just decide to walk away, you know, from everything that you have taught him or her. You know, I, I'm not talking about that they might have decided to go join the Church of Oprah uh, I, or something like that. I'm talking about completely turning the back on God. We will see today that the methods of dealing with an adult child change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Luke 15 account of the prodigal son, you know, is actually acclaimed by, you know, some literary critics as like being the greatest story that was ever written. It is for sure like a classic illustration of how to deal with the rebellion in a Christ-like manner. So this topic is really close to my heart. I wish that someone would have like drawn this, drove this biblical truth, you know, into my head like years ago because I have such a child and I'm guilty of doing it wrong. So follow with me as I read this story in Luke chapter 15, and we start with 11 through 24. And while you guys are turning there, uh, I just would point out that 25 through 32 is also a part of this story, but they are... It's really a whole different sermon, and so maybe we'll tackle those verses sometime in the future. So Luke chapter 15, 11 through 24. <clears throat> then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields and fed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. 
And when, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now, I find one of the most appealing qualities of the Bible is its realism. Unlike many resourceful books that are all theory and no reality, the Bible presents big doses of reality. It's not that there is no idealism in scripture, there is, but invariably where there is idealism, it is balanced well with realism. Take for example the nation Israel, God's chosen people, the Jews. He defends them, he protects them, he sustains them, but he doesn't hide them from the truth of sinfulness, their failures, and at times their rebellion. There is realism as he speaks of the nation Israel. Now the Bible has men and women who are people of Great courage, for sure, even heroism. He shows these men and women standing alone at times against the current of the day and were taken back by their character. But never does the Bible hedge on their scars and occasionally their warts. We see it all in reality. You know, we see Noah, for example. You know, he's hammering away at that ark, you know, against all odds that it is ever going to rain. And we are impressed with his persistence. But only in a matter of time, after the flood, we see him in a shameful condition of drunkenness, and we are embarrassed with what we see. Another example would be Peter. As he stands alone against all the people of his day and against some of the disciples as Jesus comes to the disciples and asks him, who do you say I am? And the Holy Spirit shows Peter the answer, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, that's his shiny moment. But in a matter of months, we see Peter hovering around that fire, and he's denying that he knows the one who, who is to be crucified. Guys, this is realism. And the Bible shows us that continually. And we find that what is true for the nation and what is true for the people of the Bible is also true for families. God invented the family, you know that. He holds the patent on marriage. It was his idea. One man, one woman, forever having, rearing and raising children and sending them out. It's all his plan. 
it's pictured for us in scripture as an idealistic manner. However, there is a lot of realism threaded and woven through the fabric of scripture for the family. Just for an example, if you turn your Bible to the passage uh, that I'm looking at here, um, keep your finger in Luke 15, because we're going back there in just a minute. Turn your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy 21. There are four verses that are kind of like nestled in the center of the 21st chapter of Deuteronomy that are, they're a little bit startling actually to those who have never seen them before. Deuteronomy 21, beginning with verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of his city. And they shall say to the elders of this city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. Whoa, hey. That's some pretty harsh punishment for rebellion. You know, and I, I hope that if you have a teenager here with you today, you know, I su just suggest that, hey, take the scissors away from them because they're probably going to want to cut out this passage out of your Bible when you get home. Yeah, you know, I know that, you know, if my parents followed this law, I would have surely died back in 1970. And maybe even before that. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about that this morning and I, th I was thinking, oh yeah, I would have probably died at five years old. <laughs> yeah. Now it's interesting that my, my, my Bible makes, my study Bible, it, it has an interesting comment that uh, there is actually no record that this law was ever actually carried out. However, it did serve as a deterrent to juvenile delinquency. <laughs> yeah, and so we see the end of verse 21 there is all Israel shall hear and fear. I think that fear is the fear factor that um, the children needed, and so that's how it worked. And, now, it may encourage you somewhat to know that God never has, never was pleased with rebellion. God took strong measures against it. And we see that example frequently highlighted in the Bible in the lives of people who rebel against God. Just for an example, King Saul would be one of those people. In fact, 1 Samuel 15, 23 compares rebellion to being on the same level as demonism. He also compares it to idolatry, and we know how much God hates idolatry. Heck, he, because of idolatry, his entire nation of Israel was sent off for 70 years into Babylon. Rebellion is the cause of King Saul being dethroned and removed from office. The main reason for bringing this to your attention 
is so that we can fix your mind on how realistic God's word is and to show you God's attitude towards the sin of rebellion. And even though it emerges from a gifted, brilliant child, God hates it. And a parent who is to model God's lifestyle is also to hate it. To love the child, but to hate the rebellion. Now, I want to make it clear that this is not a reference to the normal process of growth of maturity where our children become increasingly independent. I, for one, believe that one of the credos of our home should be that we help our children become independent adults. In the passing of time, as maturity increases, they handle their own finances. They, they choose their own friends. They drive their own cars. They determine self-government as they reach the level that they can handle it, you know, which is earlier for some and later for others. And I personally believe that this is not a mark of rebellion, that it is the mark of a healthy independence. Because, you know, that's, that's, what, that's the way God raises us. And that's the way that we are to raise our children. So, parents, it's our job to deal with rebellion. It will be difficult, for sure, it will always be a heart-rendering, and on occasion, you will even think you're going to lose your mind. But you must stand firm. It is always a good idea to take it to prayer and to seek wise advice from a Christian that you trust. So when we turn to Luke 15, we are not turning to theory. We are turning again to the Bible and to reality. The picture is painfully familiar, and we will be spending time developing it only where necessary. But I think that the familiarity with it will help us draw some insights that time would have normally been spent on interpretation. And I think that the passage pretty well explains itself. Now, it's the story of a boy, of course, who decided to leave home. And he's the younger of two sons, according to verse 11, and where the setting is placed for us. Verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, it's good to know that Jewish law states that when there are two sons, that the privilege of the firstborn will be twice that of the secondborn. In other words, in the case of these two sons, the oldest son will get two-thirds of the father's estate, and the younger son will get one-third. That would come either, it would come either by death, usually, or or even maybe when the ability to work has ceased for the father. But that's not the case here. This boy is shameless. And before either of those two things happen, he says, hey, I want my share and I want it now. I want to be rid of this place. I want to get out of here. And I, and I want to make my own way. He says, give it to me now. 
there is a sense of rebellion implied even in the boy's statement. Give me my wealth now. I have it coming. The father gives the wealth to him after it's properly divided, and not many days later, the younger son gathers everything, and he splits. He takes off. And so he's going on a journey into a distant country. Verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But then he had spent all there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. So this young lad has now like burned all of his bridges behind him, right? He struck out for freedom, for liberty, and he had like his money lined in his pockets, and he had hope for a good life. He began to satisfy the gratification of his heart. He longed to have those little itches scratched. You know, he didn't stop until that began to happen. He probably got a little place, you know, had a nice view. And he established friends, new friends, and began a lifestyle that he never could have been possible back home. His money bought his friends. The women came and left. It was sort of like a no-hassle sex life, you know? Freely spent without worry. But then his money ran out. And not only did his money run out, the faraway country that he ran to is having a famine. The dude's hungry. And, and the scripture is very eloquent when it says he began to be in want or in need. You know, panic replaces this freedom of feeling as it always does in the street. Verse 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen that, of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. He searched for work. He couldn't find it. This young Jewish boy was faced with the shameful task of feeding the swine in the pigsty. That's where he worked. Verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He attached himself to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to the fields where he was to feed pigs, and he was longing to eat the pigs' food. We're realizing that he was in need. He also realized that no one else cared. Not at least as much as they did back home. No one gave him anything. And you know, that's, that's life. That's, that's life in the raw. That's life in the street. That's Godless, ugly, raw, terrible living. And nobody gives a free lunch. And it gets worse. And then it gets worse. And again, it gets worse. And you just want to eat. You'll eat anything. And you'll sleep anywhere. Now, 
I'm speculating that this boy began to speak to God. Because, you know, it sure seems God is now speaking to him. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. He came to himself. Or he came to his senses. Now, let me say, parents, uh, you cannot change your child. You can rebuke your child. You can discipline your child. You can point the direction of your child. You can stand your ground against your child, but you cannot change your child. At that point, you are at the mercy of time. And I don't know how long this boy was in the streets, and, and I don't know how long he worked in the pigsty. But when he came to an end of himself, he began to look up. He came to his senses for the first time in a long time, and he thought straight. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread? Now, well, that tells us he came from an affluent family, right? Not only did he have servants, not only did he have employees, but they were well fed. My father's hired servants have bread enough, and I'm dying here. This is hunger. Listen, parents, sometimes it will take your child years to realize what he or she uh, had when they were back home. Sometimes it will take a prison sentence. Sometimes it will take years of abuse in the streets before they, before they come to their senses. Now this boy comes to his senses and he says, I will arise, go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He is thinking, hey, I'll be satisfied to live in a lean-to. You know, I'll be satisfied to work day and night. And I just want to be back with you, Dad. Listen, parents, the most significant thing in your home, the most significant thing in your home is you. Not your things, not your belongings, not how much money you have, not how many rooms are in your house, not all the fine furnishings that you have inside. The most important thing in your home is you. He says, I'm going to go back to my daddy. I'll go back to the one who treated me right. I'll go back to the one who stood firm on principle. I'll go back to my father and I'll say, make me as one of your servants. And I love the reunion part of this. He got up and came to his father. Now watch carefully verse 20. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion 
and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He felt compassion for him. Isn't that just a marvelous thought to think about? You know, he didn't come running out. He wasn't like waving his finger at him and yelling at him and telling him, hey, I told you so, I told you so. No, it wasn't like that at all. He came with his arms outstretched. He embraced him. In the Greek, it says that he kissed him repeatedly. He kissed him again and again. What, what a scene that must have been. Now, the father knew his son. He knew he would come to an end of himself. And he was watching for him daily. Now, I don't know if he was standing out on some porch of his home, whether he was out working in his fields, and all the time while he's out working, he's just like looking around. When is my son coming home? I don't know what the situation was, but what we do know is he saw him afar off. He was looking for him, and then he went running to him. He was watching for him daily. His dad didn't go begging. He didn't run to where he was at and beg him to come home. He stayed home. And while this emotion is going on, the son starts to tell his speech. Verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The father quickly jumps in and tells the slave to bring these things that that they needed, and the son didn't even get to finish his speech. He didn't get to tell him about, hey, I want to be your servant, your hired man. He didn't tell him about that part. He said, this boy needs something to wear. Put a robe on him. He needs authority. Put a ring on his finger. He needs sandals for his feet. Oh, and go out and kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. We're going to have a feast. Can you imagine the joy that was going on? You know, I just picture this boy, and you know, he's looking at the table with all the food out, and he has this memory just a few days ago, and what was he doing? He was wishing he could eat the pods that he was feeding the pigs. So the tables have really turned for his life, and... But notice the best is yet to come. For this my son was dead and is alive again. That's just awesome. You know, the father says, that boy that left here, he was dead. He was nothing like we ever had, ever raised. He was not like us. He did not believe that the same way we believe. He did not carry on like we like we trained him up to, it's like he had died. But he has been raised. He was lost, not only physically, but he was lost spiritually. He was out of it, but he has been found. It says they began to be merry. You know, imagine the joy in that home at that time. Now, for some of you, 
it hasn't ended yet. Without going into a lot of details for the sake of time, let, let me share with you three helpful principles that will help assist with our dealing with a rebel. And hopefully for some parents, this will affirm you today, and for some just food for thought for the future. And most of all, I hope it speaks to those who are currently rebelling or dealing with a child who is. So number one, so in honor of Josh, let's do it. One, there we go. Now, re a rebellious child can be allowed to ruin a home. Once again, no rebellious child can be allowed to ruin a home. Hey, I don't care how old or how gifted, no rebellious child can be allowed to ruin a home. No matter the background, no matter how intimidating, no matter how violent, no matter how vile, a child doesn't ruin the home. Number two. Number two. Number two. There you go. If the level of rebellion necessitates a separation, you must choose principle over person. You must choose principle over person. There are relational theologians that will disagree with me on this one, and they believe it's people over principle. But no, if there is a principle at stake and it's based on the word of God, no matter the relationship, you stand on the principle. Even if it is your child, it is an issue of what is just and what is right. Part of the reason that we have confused generation is because the child doesn't know where the standard is. If it bends at home, then it's going to bend at school. And if it bends at school, then it's going to bend for him in life. And right or wrong, they will become so confused that they don't know which way to go. And maybe they won't even know which bathroom to go into. <laughs> Number three. When true repentance occurs, forgiveness with a loving welcome is a response God honors. When true repentance occurs, forgiveness with a loving welcome is a response God honors. Jesus showed us the response of the Father, so you and I will know that what our response is to be. Our rebellious child, when, when our rebellious child returns. You know, it's likely that there are many families in this church who either have gone through or are going through making this most difficult decision in their life, trying to deal with a rebellious child. I know, I've been there myself and made the mistake of holding, of not holding on to the principle. I put the person first. I can testify it's a mistake. And many people have paid the price. And I pray that you will be spared this. But realistically, I know many of you will be facing these battles in the future. If that's you, hey, just remember the principles that I spoke of today. Now, if you are that prodigal child, 
no matter your age, come to an end of yourself. Look up and come home. <laughs>